gentlemen, let us now let us now uh, dive into bed. I, I had um, uh, I had a few really good questions that came up uh, during the break, um, and uh, I I thought that I would um, comment on them here. Um, so one of the questions. So several of these questions related to the relationship between Asian basin system dynamics modeling on the one hand and particle filtering and hidden Markov model on the other hand. And I may have given, if if I if I gave the impression that there's kind of, you know, like hidden Markov model was for Asian basin model and particle filtering for SD, so that's not the case, okay. Um, and, and there was some discussion, okay, is hidden Markov modeling, hidden Markov modeling, is that, is that a system science technique or is that a machine learning technique? It's a machine learning technique. And one of the things that might be confusing about it is that hidden Markov models, um, not only does the name say model, well, we talk about machine learning models too, but it, it, it can be a bit confusing, but it contains within it a, a definition of a, of, of, of a model of the world. I mean, there's a, there's a model of states and transitions between states. It's a dynamic model of sorts. Um, it's arguable whether it's a system science model, but it's a, it's a dynamic model um, of sorts. It changes over time, or at least you, one can reasonably construe it as a dynamic model. And and it, it, it's confusing because it might seem like a system science or it might seem like a dynamic modeling technique. Well, it turns out that I gave reference to the fact, to, to, I alluded to the fact yesterday that there are Markov models that are actually widely used in health, particularly health uh, HTA, health technology assessment, and um, to go way back and health economics and risk analysis. Um, uh, and uh, those Markov models have states. They have a countable set of states, a discrete set of states you can be in. And they have transitions between them um, that operate over, uh, over time. Um, and it's typically discrete time. And we run these four. This is called a Markov model, OK? Um, and again, you can argue that it's a type of, data, of a dynamic model. Um, so this is probability one, this is probability two, or let's call these A, B, C, okay? And this is probability of A going to B, and this is probability of C going to B, and this is probability of B going to C. Um, so these are probabilities. So this is a type of what you could argue that it's a type of dynamic modeling because at any one time it's in a certain state and over time that state evolves according to in this case these probabilities um i didn't present this in my discussion of data science of, of, of dynamic modeling techniques but you could argue that's a type of dynamic modeling um and i could quibble with it but it, it's at least not unreasonable to say maybe that's a type of dynamic model sure and uh, system dynamics, system dynamics models are a different sort of dynamic modeling. Agent-based models are a different sort of dynamic model. Um, and hidden Markov models take a model of the world characterized as a Markov model. Um, they, they, they start with that and they can ask, what's the likelihood that explains the, that you would see this data empirically from this? Or you can infer, you could try to figure out what Markov model would best explain this data by optimizing the maximum likelihood. So, so um, hidden Markov models are really good as a machine learning technique for Markov models, where you have a discrete set of states, A, B, or C, and say, and, and you're trying to deduce what Markov model would best explain this observed data, or what's the probability you're in A, B, or C for every little discrete bunch of time. That's what hidden Markov models are really well suited to do. Hidden Markov models are not suitable for use with system dynamics models or agent-based models, because system dynamics models and agent-based models 
have several features that make it problematic to use hidden Markov models for, with them. One of them is they have continuous state. In a system dynamics model or agent based model, it's you're typically not dealing with discrete state only or a small number of discrete states. You're not like in this state or that state or that state or that state and a small number of possibilities. You have continuous quantities here. You can, you can have more people infected, infective or fewer. You can have more people or susceptible or fewer. There's a wide set of possibilities that conceptually is, is continuous. Okay? Um, and yes, we have these discrete particles, but there's tens of thousands of them. It's not a small number of states like this. Similarly, for agent-based models, you can argue that an agent-based model has discrete states often if you just have state charts and so on. But there's so many agents and different numbers of agents at different times, and often they have some continuous component of their, of their uh, situation that describing them with a Markov model um, uh, for that reason alone, it's often a non-starter. But there's two other features of system dynamics modeling and agent-based modeling that make hidden Markov models entirely inappropriate. One of them is that they violate grossly, often, this stateless property, this memoryless property, memoryless property. Um, so, uh, so a, a Markov model has this memoryless property that no matter how long you've been in a certain state, state, state B, your chance of going on to state C in the next little bit of time, the next time slot, is, is, is the same. So uh, no matter how long you've been in B, you have the same chance previous time, say 10% chance per day of going on to C. That's a property of Markov models. And using that property, we can deduce their structure from hidden Markov models as a machine learning technique. Again, Markov models, the dynamic modeling technique, arguably, um, and hidden Markov models, the machine learning technique that allows us to deduce their structure. Uh, within a system dynamics model, um, you don't have a property, excuse me, within an agent-based model, you definitely ha don't have memoryless property. Within a system dynamics model, you can actually have, you have a memoryless property, but the transition of probability for leaving like our probability of getting infected over time, if we're susceptible, can be changing. Um, it's, it's independent of how long you've been in this state. This state is, is homogeneous. It, it doesn't matter how long you've been here, you have the same probability per unit time of leaving. But it's not fixed. For example, your probability of getting infected might depend on what here? Anyone? Your probability of getting infected here, of a given susceptible getting infected, might depend on what? the number of infectious people, yeah. Mm -hmm. So in general, for a system dynamics model, particularly nonlinear system dynamics models, our probability going from A to B, from state, from, you know, of a given person, say, going from state S to, you know, to, to state E, so to speak, um, that probability, or probably density, uh, depends on model state. It's not a fixed quantity like here, okay, uh, a, a fixed probability. Um, so it violates that aspect of, of hidden Markov uh, model assumptions, and uh, agent-based models do as well. They're much more general, and they're not amenable to deduction with a, um, a hidden Markov model. Hidden Markov model um, is good for Markov models of the underlying process uh, to deduce them, but Markov models are far too restrictive. I would emphasize this. They're far too restrictive to serve as a... Uh, system science technique of uh, very broad use. Uh, I actually don't view them as a system science technique. I actually don't view them as a dynamic mm -hmm. modeling technique, arguably. Amongst other things, we, can, we don't have to simulate it. We can just, if we want to find its, for example, its, its uh, uh, equilibria, we can just invert the matrix represented with it. And, and it turns out that we can particularly easily reason about this without simulation. So. Um, so the point is that, um, that Markov models can't be used to describe the richness that we need in the system science. And we make use of techniques like hidden mark, or excuse me, ugh, like system dynamics and agent-based modeling to describe the richness with greater, uh, uh, greater capacity. Okay? Um, so um, this is a good 
good question uh, concerning the relationship between those. And I hope that that is uh, helpful in, uh, in shedding light here on, um, on these, uh, the relationship between these. So we have to use tools like particle filtering and particle MCMC or more simply or more um, in more impoverished way, Kalman filtering to, to reason about a continuous system that has, it does not adhere to the memoryless properties. Um, we, we have to use these more sophisticated techniques. Okay. And if anyone's interested in a Kalman filtering compared to, to particle filter, I have slides on that. I might be glad to, to comment on those. Okay. Um, so that was a, a good question that had come up. Are there any other questions about particle filtering or its relation to HMMs or, 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 or uh, ABMs and, and system dynamics that I could issue before we get into some of the furthering our understanding of this technique, which will be the goals? Yes. Um, Do we go through um, calculating the weights by hand at all? Um, we certainly uh, can do that. Um, if you so, in other words, uh, uh, to sort of mechanistically see how the weights are calculated, um, I will walk you through a model that shows how to do that. And um, uh, let me think about a little exercise uh, pedagogically that might serve that purpose. I, um, I I have some thoughts about what that could look like, and uh, maybe I could put something together. Okay, yeah. Um, and we'll certainly show like how it's done in a place, in a model, and I'll be walking through why that's done in some detail. Okay. Um, other questions? Answering your questions is the foremost goal here of the, the boot camp. So if, if there's any questions you want, please let me know, and I'd be glad to address them. They are the foremost need that I want to address. This questions? This yeah. is kind of a, uh, maybe not quite the right time for this, but is there a, a class or course that you or anybody is aware of that provides an introduction to machine learning tools at a level that's accessible for people who don't speak? Real well. <laughs> Good question. Um, so um, the short answer is um, I don't know the answer to that with clarity, but what I do know is a couple of things. One thing is um, uh, we have just uh, submitted a. Um, Due date is August 1st. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Christine said there are some emails that desperately required my attention, but I get to outfit a home with furniture last night and I haven't gotten to them. Um, so uh, there is a CHR proposal going in where we are, uh, together with uh, collaborators from several institutions, proposing leading such a program across Canada. Um, uh, including at uh, Toronto, McGill, um, and uh, possibly here uh, for, for one summer, and um, in Calgary and, and Manitoba, each possibility. Um, for, that would involve teaching this for public health students, as well as for um, those coming from uh, the STEM side um, who are interested in public health. And that would involve some content like that. Um, there's a course on campus in computer science, which is taught for undergraduates and graduates, which most of my students here have taken. Um, uh, I think all my students here have taken. Um, and uh, someone like Refive coming from Biostats um, might be able to talk with you from a health science perspective, for example, um, where that might, um, might or might not be fully accessible. Um, uh, my impression is that it isn't incredibly math demanding, but I think, I think it's varied over the years in the degree to which programming is required. And there's a fair bit of Python programming required for some years that might make it, um, uh, make it challenging for someone to take the first time. Um, I would, I've also been passed out of the provost office in creating uh, programs here at the university, as you know, um, in that area. So in the fullness of time, um, I may emerge as the instructor of said course. 
Um, but let's uh, let's talk about that. Okay. I mean, you might want to talk to the students about that course, in computer science, and find out if it, if to what degree it might meet your need. Yeah. Um, other questions. Okay. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen. Yesterday, we, I, I introduced this notion of particle filtering. And I did so uh, in a somewhat hand wavy way. I, I analogized it. I talked about the needs for it. And I, I, I gave three analogies to it, three metaphors, right? I talked about particle filtering as kind of taking our models and putting them in a position that we look to, we expect, for weather models. Uh, namely, that they're constantly updated with, uh, with new data. Um, uh, secondly, I, um, I talked about um, the ways in which particle filtering was a little bit like a uh, tomography machine in the sense that it allows you to take many particular lines of evidence here or or bits of evidence here, maybe their observations, a number count of people getting infected over time, and knit them together into a three-dimensional view. Here, a view of all the light and the state of the system that's illuminated by that data. Where any piece of any given piece of data is terribly incomplete, just like any slice gathered through that tomography machine is incomplete in imaging the body, but where collectively they give that rich picture of what's going on in the body. Um, I third, further analogize it to a GPS system in the sense that it knows where you are at each point within some bound of error and can then use that information to clue you into what choices might be best to get you to your goal. And so the idea is that you're using part of filter to estimate the current state of the model with some error um, associated with it and you are Going to, you can use that information to examine different intervention strategies and the gains associated with them. So those are some grounding intuitions. But I wanted to talk uh, a little bit more before we go on to a case study um, here. And uh, we have a number of case studies to draw on. If people um, um, are interested, we could go into more details. I noted yesterday that particle filtering is designed to work with models that are stoked that have stochastics in them. It means most HMAs models and discrete event models, but system dynamics models, which are typically traditionally um, deterministic, we need some stochastics to be added to them. Um, and there's a reason for this, amongst other things, with, with resampling. Um, and I noticed, I noted that the model, um, the, the algorithm for particle filtering, in, in some ways, it's not terribly um, uh, shockingly complex. So, so what you're going to have is, within your model, many particles. And each particle has a kind of view of the world. And, and those particles, between observations, they're going to have some state of the model right now at any given time. So this one's going to be associated with this state. This one's associated with that positive state. Each is sort of staking out a positive situation from the world that it thinks is the case. And between observations, they're just going to run forward. They're just going to you know, run this model forward, this SEIR model, from, you know, time, from week 10 to week 11. Um, and each of these particles can be oblivious to the others during that time period. It doesn't interact with them at all. It just runs it forward. Okay? Um, just like running the model on, on that particle. Um, and then, at the observations, that's when the action is going to occur. And basically, it's going to correct our understanding of the underlying situation in terms of rewarding particles that are more consistent with the data and downplaying particles that are less consistent. And the way it's going to do that is by updating the weights. Because the weights represent how, how much credence we put into that particle, how, how believable it is, you know, the degree to which it's represented. And so we'll treat our, 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 our distribution as having more particles that are consistent with the data and, and less representation by those who are not consistent. 
I know it is performed recursively, so it uses the, the earlier estimates and just updates it in a new way with an observation. Um, it doesn't go back and reconsider all previous data, unlike something like, P uh, like MCMC. Um, and it samples from the state. So the idea is that these particles are samples from the states. They're, they, they collectively sort of represent a distribution. Um, and if they were unweighted, uh, they'd represent one distribution. But because they're weighted, um, they represent a different distribution than if all their weights were one. Um, so if we you know, ha increase the weight of this guy here, it'll tend to be more represented in the distribution. The distribution will tend to have a peak at this point, for example. Um, so these particles represent samples from a distribution. Collectively, they represent the distribution. That's how we keep the distribution. In hidden Markov models, the distribution over states was calculated, say, by the forward backward algorithm. It's just a vector, right? And sitting, you have a 10% chance of being sitting. Standing, a 20% chance of being uh, standing. An 80% chance of, of walking and a 0% chance of being off person, right? Um, uh, oh, man, sorry. 70% um, chance of walking. Um, uh, OK. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, um, here we have a way of representing the distribution with particles instead of with a vector, because we can't represent it easily with a vector. Amongst other things, it's continuous. Um, and uh, this is based on something called important sampling. That's where the weights come from. And particles have these, are these competing hypotheses. And, those, and there's a survival of the fittest of the particles that are consistent with it multiply and are fruitful, and those that are inconsistent die out. So here's in more detail. So suppose you have an aggregate model. Maybe it's a system dynamics model, OK, uh, for example. Uh, also called the compartmental model or ODE model or state equation model, et cetera. Um, okay, so basically you're going to create a copy of that model. Don't, don't get into how it's implemented. We're, we'll get to that later. We'll be walking through models. But, um, but you're, you're going to have a different copy of this model for each particle conceptually. Okay? Every particle is going to have a copy of the model in the sense that it's the complete state of the model. And, um, and then we're going to start it off with some distribution for initial state. Okay? We're going to, so some particles are going to say, the model should start with this distribution. Others will say they'll start with that distribution. In the LAVI model, for example, there'll be particles that involve you know, parts of, of geological crust being at different places. You know, one particle may say, I think that the, you know, the, the San Juan, the Fuca, plate is, you know, bumped up against, um, against the southern part of the um, uh, of, of South America or something like that. Um, and, and other particles will think something different. So at the initial state, different particles will start in different initial states. And then there's this process which is going to go back and forth between a prediction phase and an update phase. In the prediction phase, this is between particles. The only thing that governs these particles is the standard rules of the model. We're going to be running. It's like, remember I told you you make a copy of the model? You just run those copies of the model. Run, uh, run, model, run. You know, and it, it runs, right? Um, uh, and, um, and the weights uh, are unchanged. The weights are invariant here. They, they don't change over that time, right? So all these models run at the same time. They're just running forward, OK? Um, and there's, they don't have to worry about each other. It's at the update phase, again, that the action happens, in that the part, you have to deal with multiple sets of particles at once. So for each particle, the particle weight is going to be multiplied by a quantity. This can be different for different particles, OK? So for each particle, let's take particle one here. Okay. I hope that Dalek is picking this up. Maybe I'll sit this way. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so for each particle at this time, um, it's going to be associated with a particular state, right? Remember, each particle has a copy of the whole model conceptually, right? Um, and that model is at a given time is a certain state, right? So. 
So each particle has a certain state associated with it, a certain model of the world associated with it. Okay. Mm. Um, and that particle at this point is going to be called to an accounting, just like all the other particles. They're going to be called to an accounting of sorts. And that accounting is going to involve the same data item. All the particles um, are going to have to deal with this new observation. Maybe it's one number, like 10 people infected. Maybe it's a vector of numbers. You know, 10 adults infected, it reported as infected, and two children have been reported infected. Maybe it's a vector of totally different things. This many clinical diagnoses in emergency rooms of adults, this many clinical diagnoses in emergency rooms of children, this many mentions on social media of flu cases, of, of plausible cases, this many, this many searches for flu-related terms on Google, uh, you know, Google search, this many people reporting illness with their smartphones in a sentinel group. It can be a long series of observations of different sorts. Whatever form that observation is, um, the particles will be called to account for it. Okay? And each particle is, being, is going, to be, going to be tested for how well it accounts for this observation. And how do we test that? What's the quantitative way in which we test it? We, we ask, what's the likelihood, given this state of the model, Given that there's 992 people in the S state, three people in the E state, two people in the R, I state, and three people in the R state, what's the likelihood we would see 10 people infected? Okay, um, what's the likelihood we'd see 10 people, oh, 10 people infected, right? Um, or maybe it's a big vector of observations, as we said. But what's the likelihood we would see this observed datum given the state of this model as posited by this particle. So 10 people infected. Um, well, there's lots of susceptibles in this. Um, there is a couple exposed, but they don't, they're not germane to the new people. For, for a person to get, uh, to get infected, for people to be getting infected, like these 10, there's got to be some people to get infected, susceptibles. And there's got to be some people who infect them, eyes. So the question would be, you know, how Likely is it, if we had 992 people susceptible and two people infected, that we'd see 10 people getting infected in the particle. Well, each of those two people might, might go around, right? They might be teaching a boot camp and, and infect, you know, lots of people at the boot camp or they're, you know, they're, they're circulating in their families and infecting people. So um, we'll have some computation for this, what's the likelihood we would see that? And uh, to, to unpack that a little bit for those who have experienced dynamic modeling before, um, what you'd actually be probably dealing with here is in the model, in the simulation model, you probably have some estimate here. Um, if, if the cases of reporting are coming, let's say, from people who have finished their Let's suppose latent and incubation periods are the same, and you this is where reporting comes from. You're probably going to reason about how many people in the model are coming on this flow, right? And then what's the reporting rate? Of those who are really getting sick, really becoming infected, what fraction of them are reported? And so we'll have a likelihood function that involves some number of people who are truly getting into a state where they could be reported, like they're getting infected, they're emerging from their latent period um, and their incubation period, so they're developing symptoms. And as calculated by the model, by this model state, for this particular particle, and then we'd be considering the chance that each is reported, and we'd ask, okay, suppose there are 20 people who the model calculates as, as getting infected here, or sorry, emerging from latency, okay? Um, uh, so that's going from exposed to an infective state. Exposed are people who are infected but are not yet showing symptoms or infective, okay? Um, so if there's 20 people calculated in the model here, maybe that's calculated by, you know, E over some, um, some you know, incubation uh, period tau or something like that. If, the, if this is just a quantity in the model, you calculate. 
you would then say maybe each of these has a you know 50% chance of being reported what's the probability that that if this is this 20 is resulting from this particular um, this particular particle if it thinks with this state of the model that there should be 20 people truly showing sim starting to show symptoms and there's a and there's a 50% chance that each one would be uh, would be reported the probability that we would observe 10 is pretty high it's pretty high by contrast if you think there's only one person in the exposed state there's no way you're going to be able to have 10 people reported and so the probabilities can be extremely low let's suppose there's another particle that posits zero people in the exposed state you know 999 you know something like this um, uh, this would have zero probability of explaining this observed quantity so the likelihood there is going to be zero so we can compute for each given that each particle is associated with a full representation of the state of the model that it posits as the case out there in the world we can then assess the likelihood often quite readily of observing this data now maybe this datum consists of a whole bunch of things. Children, adults, you know, social media mentions. Often we, we unpack it into, so we need a, a likelihood function that's multivariate in character. It includes multiple types of observations. Often, the sort of simple thing is you turn it into a multiplication of, of, of um, independent likelihood functions. Or if, if you feel up to it, you can do a joint likelihood, okay? Um, uh, but you know we might have a likelihood function of seeing the number of those adults given the model state times the likelihood of seeing those number of kids getting reported given the model state etc um, so we might just turn into a product of likelihoods but the idea is for each for each uh, particle we assess its likelihood and then guess what folks oh <laughs> okay um, thanks um, I run a what's called a, I run this on a, on a virtual machine and it has problems with that. Um, okay, um, so for each particle, you're gonna update the particle weight by how consistent it is. So we wanna reward particles that are more consistent with this data and we wanna downplay particles, or I don't like to use the word, but punish particles that are not very consistent with the data. So we wanna, we wanna invest in particles or, or, or empower them if they're consistent. So what do we use? We use the likelihood function. And there's a theoretic reason for this. It's not an ad hoc decision. There's a precise reason that it all works out math-wise. But basically, we multiply each particle's weight by the likelihood. We update it, so its weight is updated to the old weight from the last observation times um, this likelihood. So if it's a high likelihood, that weight will tend to grow or will tend to be larger. If it's a very low likelihood, like zero, the weight will now be zero. If it's a likelihood that's very small, the weight, when you update the weight with that small likelihood, it will become much smaller, right? And so the weight will be updated according to the old weight times this likelihood. And that will tend to reward particles that are more consistent with the data, in other words, have high likelihood of observing it, and downplay particles that are not very consistent with the data, right? Uh, or down weight particles. And remember, a weight is used to determine the level of representation of a particle. So if something has larger weight, there's more of it in the distribution. If it has smaller weight, there's fewer of it. And so we will be boosting the distribution in the direction of those particles that have high weight. Right? And in those particles that are more consistent with the data and downplaying it, those that are inconsistent with the data. Um, now, after this process, there's uh, something called resampling. And you could call this survival of the fittest. The basic idea is, look, the, the weight and the particles, they capture the distribution. But sometimes the so-called effective sample size is too low. There's too much, there's too many particles that are very little weight. That is, that it's just a waste of time because they have weights of zero and they weight, you know, 0.001. And then there are some particles, maybe just a few of them, that have like 
a weight of 0.92 or, you know, well, so it can only be one of those, right? Because they have to sum to one, all the weights are point, point 0.3 or point 0.4. These are particles that have a lot of credibility associated with them compared to those ones with weight 0.01 or 0.02. And, and yet, we're, we only have a few of them and we have this whole set that have low weights. And so we go through this process called resampling to correct that situation. So the idea is we resample them and the weights get reset. And the ones that are highly weighted will tend to be resampled and will multiply. There's a, there's a survival of the fittest. There's some, you know, they're fruitful and they multiply. Those that are very low weights will tend to die out. Those that have zero weights will die out. Um, and so the particles with higher weights reproduce with, with high likelihood. Okay. So what you're going to see is something like this. This is from an adaptation of the, the thesis of Li Shaoyan. Um, and uh, here, uh, at a given time prior to resampling, this is just after the weight updates, after we've rewarded particles that are highly consistent with the data, that's like the top one, you know, um, this, this one that's, that's really large. large. Um, uh, and th then there's some that are really small. They're, 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 they're low weight. And with the resampling process, what's going to happen is we're going to draw from, like we always do. Remember, we never draw from the particles just any old particle with equal chance. We're drawing from them according to their weight. And, and this is what we're going to do with the resampling. If we have 1,000 particles, we're going to have a new set of 1,000 particles that are going to be the old ones. We're just drawing from them according to their weight. So particles that are big will be multiplied many times, right? Um, uh, and particles that are really small might not be drawn at all. Particles at zero weight won't be drawn at all. And so we're going to go through, for each of these new 1,000, we're just going to draw from the old particles. And so a given particle will multiply. So this particle might be represented three times, might be represented 10 times, because it is a high weight compared to lower. That's what the weight means. It means it's more highly represented, right? Something with a weight of 10, well, excuse me, a weight of, of you know, 0.5 is five times as represented as something with a weight of 0.1. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to be that's what the weight means. They're five times as representative. And we're going to put that into action in this resampling process. So something with a weight of 0.5 will be five, 10 on average be five times as representative as something that just had a weight of 0.1. And some will die out. Some, many of those with very, very, very low weights will die out. So there's a survival of the fittest here. The fit ones survive. And what, is they, what are they fit based on? Based on the weight. What is the weight based on? Well, it's based on consistency with the latest sample. Remember, it was multiplied by the, by the likelihood. But it's based on consistency with previous samples. Because when we updated the weight, we multiplied the earlier weight by this new likelihood. And the earlier weight was determined by the previous likelihood as well, and by the previous likelihood to that. And we, so it, the weight captures for this particle's lineage, or this particle's um, history, sort of how consistent it's been. Those that have high weights have been consistently more competitive in, in, in explaining the empirical data. Those with low weights are, have been less effective at explaining that data. Okay? Um, and then these particles are going to go on and evolve. They're going to evolve between this observation point and the next one. How will they evolve? Well, you'll notice they'll evolve in ways that are not identical. So this particle up here, it ends up evolving into you know, several particles, which end up being of different size. You may say, how could that be? It's the same particle. It's the same old particle. How could it evolve to be of different size? Well, bear me out. Hear me out on this. So what's going to happen is, remember, the model's evolving over time between time t and time t plus 1, right? It's running. Remember I said it, it just runs between observation points. The weights are not adjusted until time t plus 1, but it just runs between them. So you might say, well, wait a minute. It started totally the same initial state. That's what it means that this big particle got multiplied. It's the same initial state it's starting with. Or say, I shouldn't say initial state. 
this big particle state was multiplied for each of these, because each particle is a complete representation of the state of the model. So all of these three up here that came from this big um, particle, uh, those all have the same state, right? This big pudgy particle. And that, those all have the same state. And as you run it forward stochastically, it, it, it's going to diverge because there's stochastics in the model. Those diverge in, in where they go. They, they carry different values at the end of this time, time t plus 1. So they started the same state because each particle is a copy of the state. And this, each of these new particles inherited the state of this, this big punchy one. And, and then they're going to evolve forward stochastically. So but the, uh, just before the observation at time t plus 1, these particles that came from this, you know, from this mother particle, they're all going to have the same, they're going to have different state by that point. And then they're going to observe a new data, a new observation, and that will update their weights. And maybe this one will be more consistent with the new observation because of the stochastics that happen between them than this one or this one. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So this particle that had a high weight here following the last weight update during the resampling process, which takes place instantaneously when the sample size is too small following an update, we just say time to resample, time to make the donuts. And we, we, we do the resampling. These particles get multiplied multiple times because it's highly represented. Survival of the fittest, it gets multiplied. Um, those with high weight will tend to get, you know, um, to get multiplied. Some of them will die out. These all start with the same state because they're all from the same mother particle. And it, they have the mother particle state. But then because the model is stochastic, their states will diverge between t and t plus 1. And then at time t plus 1, we will judge them according to a new data point, a new observation. And because of the stochastics, some of their stochastic evolution, some of the particles that originate with that mother particle are more consistent with the new datum, some are less. And so they'll, by this time, their weights may be different. Okay? Um, yes, Lavi. Most, like, high likelihood. Yeah. And then we, we basically replicate that into different particles, right? Correct. We, we end up, um, it, it ends up having many progeny. It has many, many children here. Those with high weights reproduce. Those with low weights will tend to, uh, to die out. So, so yes, that's multiplied into many particular children who, unlike you know, in the in the natural analogy, will have um, will share the uh, the same initial state. They'll they'll all be identical to this particle in terms of the state that they represent they initially. Carry the, they carry the same value of life. Precisely. Okay. So this represents a hypothesis. Remember, the particles are representing hypotheses for what's going on in the world, and they're all going to start with the same belief about the world as this one had that the continents or the crust, uh, the blocks of crust were in these positions, or how many people in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the external world are susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered. That this had a certain belief in, uh, uh, from that after the update with this datum, with the, with the new datum at time t. Um, and, and that belief about the world from this particle it, well, yeah, so it had a belief, and, and actually that belief is not altered by the update. The belief of, this, this is one of the amazing things, and I'll get to Cheryl here. So, so, so I want you to try to grok this. No particle, when we have a new observation, no particle changes its belief. There's no particle that alters its belief in any way. What happens is the weights of the particle are modified to, to, to accentuate, to, to empower, to better represent, to better, to, to better give credence to, to, um, 
to, to uh, treat as more populous particles that are consistent with that datum and to downplay particles that are inconsistent with the datum. So there's no updating of the belief of any particle. What is updated is belief of the system, the, the set of all particles collectively because the weights have been updated to, to um, emphasize or give more, more weight to, give more credence to those particles that are consistent with the data. That's what's going on. Um, uh, does that make sense? Uh, let me, uh, does that answer your question, though? No. Okay. <laughs> so try again. Try again. No, no, no. I would just because when I look at, into that diagram, of yeah. the big particle into multiple children's, I was wondering those children's are they the exact same copy? Exactly. Like the same, like the parents. Exactly. Or those children's are the copy that, and then we take that and multiply that with say is doing some stochastic. No. No, okay. no. These are exactly the mother state. The mother state, the belief of this particle was evidently highly, the belief of this particle and its ancestors over past times, right? For past times, have evidently been highly consistent with the evidence. They've been highly aligned or, or, or um, in, in, you know, uh, in, in, uh, in, in a high degree of um, matching to the um, uh, to the evidence empirically, and that particle has a certain belief uh, about the state of the world at time t, and that exact belief. When I say belief, I mean it. It has a complete. It has one hypothesis and exactly one hypothesis about the current situation in the model in terms of the complete state of the law. And then that exact belief is shared by its children. Mm -hmm. they, come, they believe that exact thing that the mother did. Mm -hmm. By the way, the mother, the mother is no longer here with us, right? Um, um, the, the, the children have been multiplied from it. Um, this was their mother. And we actually speak about this. We're going to accumulate ancestry matrices, where we trace them back to sample from trajectories, which is awesome. Which is awesome. <laughs> Sampling from trajectories is terrific, and I'd love to work with one of the students here to, to actually sample from trajectories and show me a graph of that. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know that's been done yet. Um, but, um, but here, these all have the same belief of the mother exactly. And then, you know, between time and time t plus one, the model's run. That's the dotted line. The model is run, and there's lots of stochastics going on. So this belief as the world the, about the state of the world at time t, which is identical between these children, these three children, um, this for each child that evolves over between time and t plus one, because the model's running, but the model is stochastic. So these, where these children end up at time t plus one, is different from each other. It's like they're, you know, they're they're identical children, they're identical twins, but then they end up in different states because of you know, the stochastics of the, of the world, one catches the streetcar, the one behind it does not, and, you know, the one who catches the streetcar, um, you know, meets their future husband on the streetcar, and the other one, you know, um, marries the girl next door, or something like that. Well, sorry. Um, <laughs> identical to them. They got to be the same sex, sorry. Um, <laughs> fly the equipment, but um, you get the idea. Um, so, um, Modeling and storytelling, I tell you, something there. So, so these particles end up in different states between t plus one in their view of the world, because the, you know they have a vested view as it was at time t, but that view includes stochastics, and so they think the stochastics will be going in different ways between time t and time t plus one. Mm -hmm. So they're going to end up with a different guesstimate as to what the situation will be at time t plus one. They're going to put their eggs in this basket, or that basket, or that basket. And then, when we have the observation at time t plus 1, let's suppose, you know, here's time t plus 1, and we end up observing, we end up observing, uh, you know, uh, 6 or something. Um, some of these particles will be more consistent with that expectation and some less so, and, and therefore, their weights will be different, and that's why they're shown in different sizes. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so Cheryl, I think, and then uh, and then uh, Shreem. No. I, I might have answered my own question, but um, resampling thing is still confusing me a little bit. Um, right. Would, so we've got a particle. Say the top particle had a weight of 0.6. Yeah. Does it, d depending on its sort of relative importance to the other particles, do we get three of 0.2, or is it a resampling no. where we have some sort of normalization and we end up with a whole bunch of particles of exactly the same weight These, that, yep. that add up to like one or something like that? They're all reset to one. Okay. Following they're resampling, reset they're one. all reset to weight one. But and that, that's why they're shown all as the same okay. size. And the number is going to depend on the, the weight of the original particle. The, the number meaning, oh, how the many of them yeah, there exactly. are? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Because remember, it is a, like, whenever we want to say something meaningful about the population of particles, right. we never just grab particles willy-nilly without worrying about their weight. We're always drawing from the set of particles with a probability of getting each particle according to its weight. So that's why a particle that has weight 8 is, excuse me, has weight 0.8 is, it, it, it really represents 8 times as many particles as something with a weight of 0.1. And so, so um, all their weights, okay, I said rate reset to 1. It's actually a reset to one over the number of particles, right. so they sum to one, but it's all uniform weights. Okay. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. What? What? Um, okay, um, so uh, does that address your question? Okay, sure you know? Yeah, because you, your weight is, is less than one, and they multiply the, the, the weight again to have even smaller. Good question. Um, so, uh, great question. So um, the weight is multiplied, you're, you're exactly right, it's normal. Um, uh, so your weight is multiplied by a likelihood, which uh, here is going to be between zero and one. And, and so your weight will always become smaller after uh, it, that immediate multiplication, right? It will, it will never grow. It will only become that same value if, if you have a likelihood of one. But otherwise, it, it'll, it, it'll be smaller than your original weight. And what I haven't said, and I should should say, is that when you update the weights by multiplying by the likelihood, at the end of that process, you actually normalize the weights so they all sum to one. Okay, and there's a mathematics behind this. This is again not ad hoc stuff. It's not like, you know, oh, what the heck? They're not summing to one. You know, they're getting smaller. Let's let's divide them by the sum. No, there's there's a there's a a really good base in theory that's behind it, which is it, you can actually find if you want to look forward in my slides, but uh, we'll talk about it some. I won't go into all the details I might in a math course, but, um, but uh, these weights, after they are computed, after the weights are, are, have been updated, they are renormalized so they all sum to one. And um, so at any one time, the weights of the particles always sum to one. I hope that's helpful. Um, so, so you said it at time t there was um, each particle has its own model, right? Is, is that, is that that's right. right. Each particle at any given time, a given particle has its own copy of the model yep. in the sense that it has a specific representation of a certain model state that it believes obtains in the world, that it believes is a description of the world. And that involves a specific, just like if I were to run a model here, let's say the model of hares and foxes, or Wade's beautiful adaptation of that um, for state space insight uh, at an ag at a agent based level. Um, if I stop that, if I pause it at any time, you know, there's a certain state of the model that that obtains that, right? It's a stochastic model, let's say um, a Wade's model, but it, but if we stop it at any one time, it has a certain state, right? And each of these particles is associated with a copy of the model in the sense that it has a certain state at time t it, that it thinks is a description of the world. It thinks is a description of the external world. And, it, yeah. and, and so once it's um, separated from the mother particle, yeah. the children's version of the model, yeah. is that represented, is that, is that based on the mother's version? It's the exactly the mother's version. And so the stochasticness comes in 
over when, time. Well, because they're now three or five entities instead of the one. Correct. Okay. And so the stochastic comes from the model. Correct. Yeah, okay. So, so between time t and time t plus one, each of them has different, um, is buffeted by different stochastics. Um, each of them has a different detail about the reporting rate and how it varies or about uh, the number of particles that, that are, are getting infected because of the vagaries of small numbers and transmission and so on. And so they started all as identical twins, but with the ravages of time, they end up in different circumstance at time t plus one, um, which, which leads them to have different beliefs about the world, right? And at time t plus one. Um, when, when I say they evolve differently, I mean, their belief about the world is being characterized by the simulation. Each, each is, is vesting in the simulation its belief of how the world develops. And by time t plus one, each of them has a different state of that model as it evolves stochastically. And therefore, uh, that means a different belief about what's going on externally. Each believes that this model it's running is a good representation of the, of the dynamics of the world, but each are affected by different the vagaries of different stochastics. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Question. Yes, Lavi. Um, so These are great questions. Every single particles have their own models that represent the world. Conceptual, yeah. Okay, so if every single one of them have the same stochastic? No, so, the sto yes, if every one of them had the same stochastics, if, if every one of them had the same random number seed and, and kind of was affected in the same way by stochastics, then the, this wouldn't be a meaningful exercise because once they multiplied, from then on they'd all be the same. And you wouldn't, you, you'd end up having a model population which, which was, had put all its eggs, if not in one basket, in just a few baskets of the one that happened to be multiplied a lot. You wouldn't have the requisite diversity and openness that you'd like to different perspectives on the world that lets the model learn effectively. This, this is a deep point about particle filter. When I talk about a level of, of understanding philosophically or intuition and somewhere up there, that you want a model that, that has, it stakes out a certain belief about how the world evolves, the regularities of the world. But it needs a certain degree of give about its belief about the world to be persuaded by new data that's really different. And if all the particles are in lockstep, they all believe exactly this about the world, the world is the worst for it because you're not going to be able to learn effectively. Um, because you're not going to, remember, no particle, no particle here changes its belief about by virtue of seeing an observation. No particle in the least alters its belief about the world. They believe this and they believe it hard, that this is the case. And um, some particles will have a hard belief that is, um, that is uh, in more, more in line with the data, and those particles will tend to have higher weight. Those, some particles have a belief that runs afoul of the world, that runs counter to the evidence. Those particles will tend to have a lower weight and we are rewarding the particles that have higher weight um, because they are more competitive. But every particle has exactly one belief at a given time about the world. And that belief is not altered by encounter with the evidence. What alters, what shapes the model's ability to learn is the fact that we can favor particles that are, are more consistent with the evidence. And to do this in a meaningful way, in a way that's powerful, we need a diversity of particle beliefs, right? Because the particles, no particle's gonna alter their beliefs, so we wanna have particles that are, it's like an ensemble method, for those who are familiar at all with, with these components of machine learning. We want a diversity of possible views of the world, because we want to, we wanna foster beliefs that are more consistent with the data. If we only have a few views of the world, of highly successful particles that just believe hard a certain thing, and they're occupying, you know, there's only five beliefs out there, we'll be impoverishing our ability to learn as effectively from observations. 
It's by having a rich set of differing particle beliefs that we will be able to, to shape an understanding of the underlying situation that's consistent with the evidence in a rich way. And, and that's why we want stochastics to be involved. So you are asking, Levy, if you have the same outcomes, if all the stochastics yielded the same thing, um, uh, you know, what would happen? And, and it will lead to a situation which is impoverished in terms of diversity of particles and impoverished in terms of the ability of the model to learn. But I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Uh, I was just thinking that like when, when we first build the, the overall belief, like build the, the, the belief of how the word works, yeah. so then, yeah. and then make the copy for every single particles. I mean, I thought that also, for example, to go to state A from state B, the randomness that we yeah. introduce for the model overall is yeah. 0.5, you know, plus or minus 5 or something okay. like that. Okay. Okay. So that I, that's what, the, what I was saying. So then every single particle, when they go to the next day, they're going to introduce that amount of randomness for every single one of them. So when they go from time t to t plus 1, yeah. they will be shaped. Mm -hmm. Their randomness. Randomness will shape all of these identical twins in different ways. Mm -hmm. Some of these identical twins will, you know, will be drafted into the army. Some will be, um, some will uh, happen to, you know, have certain life circumstances. Some will be, you know, um, injured by a falling ladder, and and that's going to lead to them to be different by this time. If we, if they did not have different chance circumstances, as I said, we'd end up with a particle impoverishment. And in fact, there's a, a theory of particle filtering, of sequential Monte Carlo methods, that deals with particle impoverishment, okay? This is a known issue with particle filtering. And introducing stochastics can really help uh, here, okay? Um, uh, so, uh, if if anyone's interested, I could you know, give them reference to uh, to to uh, to uh, uh, literature related to that. Okay, um, these are wonderful questions. These are the best questions on particle filtering that anyone has asked me thus far. I, my hat is off to you. Yes. Um, so a few questions. Uh, the awesome. I guess I'm confused at how like the past information is used going forward. Like, is it that you know the uh, the replications will kind of stay in the same neighborhood? Good question. So, um, good question. These replications of this mother particle all start out in exactly the same circumstance for the entire state of the model. Okay. Yeah, so they'll all have, so for, so for this SEIR model, they will all have exactly the same state as of time t that they'll be starting out with in their life's journey going from time t to time t plus one. They'll all share exactly this belief is the situation in the model. And then this will evolve for each of them, for each of these twins, it will evolve stochastically in different ways to time t plus one. For an agent-based model, if we, if we think about generalizing this to an agent-based model, if I could stretch your minds for a minute, each of these particles is going to be associated with a complete copy of the model in the sense of copy of the model state. So each of them is going to have you know, this agent. So this particle one, I think, agent A is connected to agent B, and, and you know, agent B is connected to agent D, but not to agent uh, C, and, and, and each of those agents will be in a certain state, and you know, this one is sick, this one's not, in this way. And, and w when we multiply this mother particle, each of these children particles is going to inherit that exact view of that's the situation in the world right now at time t. But as they evolve to time t plus 1, because of stochastics, they might have started with this shared belief of the situation at time t, but their perception of what's going on in the world in terms of their representation of the state of the model will be different because of stochastics by time t plus 1. 
I don't know if 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 I'm um, making that clear though. Will they like each have the same mm -hmm. probability distribution or something like you know when it gets to the very end? What uh -huh. do you choose? I guess. Well, okay. You mean at the very end of the entire time? Yeah. So I guess like yeah. if yeah. I'm thinking of it as a Markov model. Okay. Where they each have their same distribution of transitioning to different states. Oh, I see. How they're all related. Okay, so so this is a this is a very savvy question. Um, so these particles differ only for particle filtering. These particles differ only in terms of their belief about the state of the mole. Like here, it's how many people are susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered. They they actually share the same belief in parameters, unless those parameters are part of model state, okay? So, um, it would be as if, imagine that in a hidden Markov model, if you, if you, you know, find Markov model something uh, that's useful as a point of reference, um, imagine if each particle represented a different possible state in that model. So we have one particle that represents, I'm in states, that, that, that represents at time t, I believe I'm in a sitting state. Another particle says, I'm in a standing state. Another particle says, um, I'm in a sitting state too. Um, and another one says, I'm lying down or whatever. And each of them is a different weight that represents sort of their plausibility or their, their um, uh, the, the consistency with with the evidence, which represents something that that represents how how uh, frequent how how strongly they're represented in the distribution. That would be another way of representing the distribution, which we just showed as a vector for a hidden Markov model. Um, so you could have that, um, but here the the uh, for a, um, a, a system dynamics model. Each of these represents a full state of this model. For an agent-based model, it would be a full state of the agent-based model. And, um, and uh, here, it's not going to represent uh, parameters, except <coughs> if you have a dynamically varying parameter, let's say reporting rate, that's altered over time in stochastic ways. Okay? And one of the best ways, I think, to help communicate this will be to see Sha Yan's example right after lunch, which, which is going to walk you through a particular example of how this applies, what the state of the model was, and what parameters were incorporated in the state, et cetera. And that might, might help. But, but I want to make sure I'm trying to address here. So, um, so do you want to um, ask more questions? So you get to the end. I guess the, the end goal is to see ah, um, right. how many are in each OK. State. So the end goal here, good question, good question. So I'm going to harken back to the analogies I gave. Okay. Um, um, let's think about the weather analogy. Um, with the weather analogy, um, sometimes with our weather forecasts, um, we will have, uh, you know, expectations of uh, the the future that are that are couched probabilistically, like uh, between two to four inches of rain over the next day, or something like that. And what we're going to get out of this is a probabilistic description of the current situation. Um, so at any given time, let's say time t, let's say time t plus one, um, regardless of whether it's before or after resampling, um, at any given time, we're going to have, the model's going to represent a distribution of possibilities of what's the case now. So it's like it's um, taking all the data till now and giving us tomographic picture of how many people are they are in the population likely to be susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered? That's a distribution over that. So 
what, what this is giving us, it's almost like we have a lens to turn observations about the world. Given our model, we have a uh, lens to turn observations about the world. What does it imply is currently going on in the model probabilistically? So those observations may be very noisy. They may be incomplete. They may relate to only one part of the model. But they're going to imply a distribution among particles where each particle has hypotheses about all states of the model, S, E, I, R. And so what this is going to give, it's almost like we have a way of turning a time series of observations and projecting it into what does that mean is probably the case right now in the model. What is that going to be likely the case um, you know, at time t plus 1? And, and uh, so it kind of gives us a way of saying, what's probably the state of even latent areas of the system, like number of recovered people, number of susceptible people, that we can't actually observe directly? This gives us a way of, of probing what that is. It, like, because collectively, if you look over all the particles, it's a distribution, a joint distribution, a joint distribution over S E I R. You know, it's saying, Probably there's more susceptibles in the population, but there's got to be at least some infectives, and it's a joint distribution over all of them. That's one thing it gives you. Another thing it gives you is the ability to sample through trajectories. So this is a very powerful thing. If we keep track of a particle and who its mother was, maybe I should say who's your daddy, but um, you know, it, it's who its mother was, who that particle's mother was, that particle's mother. We can actually sample from the final weights, the final weights, we can actually sample full trajectories. And these are different stories about what has happened over time, going all the way back, that tell us, at this time, this was probably the case, probabilistically. At that time, that was the case. Each particle is associated with a specific story, you know, um, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. It's like my family tree. It's like my family lineage. Um, and that family lineage had people in each cer a certain circumstance for each previous point in time. So I can draw from the final set of particles, I can draw different stories about what happened in the population over time historically. Another thing I can do is get a sample of trajectories, like a distribution of trajectories, which are kind of a distribution of stories. Another thing I can do is, from, well, from this final time, I can run it forward here. After I have no more observations in place, I can run it forward and see probabilistically what's likely to play out over the coming weeks and months. Okay, So it's like this. So if, if at, the, well, at the final time here, um, Shayan's graphs are much much nicer, so I'll just uh, skip forward uh, here. So it's like if I've observed all these particles here, I have some distribution of particles at this time. Um, this is and, and this is when data coming in ceases. I don't have any data. This is now. Okay, this is now. I've observed all this data. The model's been grounded in all that data. It's been honed as to how many people are in each of these states. So right now, the distribution of the model captures a distribution of a possible states of the model. Maybe some particles are more plausible, and those are highly represented in the distribution. Others are less likely. But it's a distribution over the state right now, including latent factors of the state. And then we can project forward. And these, as I said earlier, there's learning involved. Like if you haven't seen much recent incidents, the particles that are going to have high weights now are going to be those that predicted low incidence recently. The particles that have high weights now or that are highly multiplied after, after resampling are those that were consistent in their expectations with this data. They posited low number of case counts to be reported. Those particles will almost always have predict, they will be associated, they will capture the fact that they believe there's more susceptibles. And so the particles that are highly fit here, that have, have survived this survival of the fittest through this process, will tend to be ones that say there's lots of susceptibles, because there have been no infectives. And that will lead to many of those particles to expect a, an outbreak in the near future. Same thing here. 
So it allows us to project forward and see what's likely coming in light of all of this evidence, as well as the model structure. So, so you have these set of particles at one time, so what? Well, one thing, you can sample trajectories historically. Two, you can understand what's probably the case right now. How many people are susceptible, exposed, infected, vaccinated successfully out there, even though we don't have data directly about those things. Three, you can project forward um, to anticipate what might be coming, uh, including coming outbreaks. So you could identify there might be an, an outbreak coming up, and that's what <laughs> this is. And you can also examine the effects of intervention. So given all the recent learning, all the recent evidence as to um, the number of cases of people getting reported as ill, you have a belief about the state of the model now that extends across latent factors and observable factors that you can then ask what if questions about what if what if we undertook this intervention? What if we took that one? And you can get probabilistic expectations out for what the gains are, say, of intervention A versus intervention B. Probabilistic because we have some uncertainty how many vaccinated people are out there. Some particles think there's more. Some particles think there's less. And that's going to end up materially influencing how effective an outbreak response immunization campaign would be or, or further immunization advisories. But we'll be able to probabilistically estimate what would be the gain of, of say, a, a outbreak response immunization campaign versus a more traditional <coughs> immunization campaign versus um, you know shutting down the schools versus doing nothing. We'll be able to probabilistically estimate that from the final set of particles. If we were put in place these interventions going forward, what might we see? I don't know if that's helpful, mm -hmm. but that gives some sense what you can do with those set of particles we end up with. Because those are a savvy set of particles. Those have been the ones that survived their contact with the data. Those have been the ones that have exhibited the greatest consistency with the empirical evidence. And therefore, they're a savvy set to use, in terms of their beliefs about the broader world, to use to understand that broader world, to understand what's happened historically, to understand what's likely coming, and to understand the trade-off between interventions. Does that make sense? Great questions. More questions? Right now? Okay. Other other questions? Yeah, because Xiao Yan is going to give a, a, a lecture after lunch. Yes, Sonia. Um, so in terms of like the T minus one value, there's no real inference that we make based on them. Uh, that we, like, we, we get, we, we sort of pull, like in those plots you've sort of it looks like we've, we've sort of confirmed that that's the that's the model. The model is performing to, to some sort of effectiveness. And are we pulling all of the the beliefs into because uh, we have a distribution of beliefs? We're we pulling them to, to understand the median or, or some mode of belief. We can. Um, so good question. So, um, so I I thought I heard two different questions here, and and I'll try to deal with each of them. Um, so, and, and tell me when I'm off base and, and about your question, I'd be, be glad to comment. So, the, the observations at time t minus one, or time t minus two, or time t minus three, time t minus four, et cetera, those observations have all made their mark. They've all shaped the particle's weights, and then after resampling the particle population, um, which have, we've inherited here. So this particle here, this big particle, um, its very girth, its size, represents its consistency potentially with evidence not only at time t, but time t minus 1, time t minus 2, because it's been getting potentially, you know, it, its relative weight is higher than has been growing compared to other particles in previous times. So it's not like this size is only due to the observation of time t and everything else is lost from the past. But far from it. These particles, the very fact that they exist, that they have their mother and grandmother and great-grandmother, etc., is a reflection of the fact that they have survived encounter with data over time. And their weight 
will be reflective often of their weight over several times. Because resampling only occurs when the effective sample size is too low. It doesn't occur every time, okay? So a, a weight will often mean it's been consistent with several previous past um, um, uh, sets of observations. But the, unshot, the upshot of, is if a particle's here, and particularly if it has high weights, it's probably pretty consistent with the evidence over time, okay? The second question though is, um, do we ever compute like modal values or mean values and measures of sexual tendency or whatever on these distribution of particles? Absolutely, but we always do so drawing them with a probability according to their, to their weight. We never, we never just perform it over all particles, take the mean. Um, uh, that wouldn't be meaningful because you can't consider what a particle means in terms of its role in the distribution without considering its weight. So if you want to compute the mean state that the models, what is the kind of average state that the models believe is the case, right? If we want to compute across all particles, what's their kind of, um, uh, their mean belief uh, about the state of the underlying system? Um, you know, say uh, a few days out, we want to compute the mean of, of this, take into account some particles are, you know, worth more than others. What we would do is we would draw from particles with the probability of getting each according to its weight. So one that had a weight of 0.5 is five times as likely to be drawn as a weight of 0.1. Uh, by the way, this is made quite, it, it's a very simple thing to do. It's, it may sound complicated, but I think it's built into R and you know, lots of things allow this resampling to be done, important sampling, just behind the scenes. But basically, we would draw particles according to their weight. Um, so one that's highly weighted will be drawn a lot. And for each such particle, we're accumulating the mean. So we're taking the mean over the drawn particles, not over this underlying population of particles, which are you know, a very different pedigree, very different sort of levels of significance. Instead, we're taking that mean over the, the particles we're drawing from this underlying distribution with probability according to its weight. So if something has a weight of twice as much as another one, it will be twice as well represented in that weight as, as in that mean as the other particles. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's what we're that's what we're doing here. And we might well take the the mean, um, and we 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 might take you know the median, and those might be quite interesting values. Um, we might also look at the distribution because when you're dealing with nonlinear models, models that have surprising counterintuitive behavior that are very common. Um, like infectious disease models, you might see some particles positing no people infected and some positing a lot. Um, some part that posit the disease has died out, for example, some positing a lot um, in some circumstances. You can get, you can get multimodal distributions out because after all, you're representing a distribution here. And so one of the reasons, one of the advantages for distributions is particularly for nonlinear models, you might have some particles positing something very different is going on. And this is one of the traditional problems with common filtering with nonlinear models, that with a nonlinear model, let, let's suppose a model of infectious disease. You might have some models that posit, you know, we have, we have herd immunity in the population and therefore the amount of people getting affected is gonna be very small. And <coughs> those particles, if they see uh, you know, cases being reported, they might say, their interpretation might be, there's actually very few cases, it's just they're very effective at being reported. You know, doctors actually aren't seeing too many cases of measles, but when there is one, they report it with very high likelihood, and that's why we're seeing these cases. It's just indicative of a small number. There might be other particles that posit, no, we're not, we haven't achieved herd immunity, you know, there's, there's quite a few people out there infected, and they posit very low reporting rate and a higher, um, higher in underlying incidence rate. Right? Those are particles that, are, that have different views of the world, different interpretations of the situation in the world. And the, as you might expect, um, the policy implications of each will be quite different. You know, one, will, one, one might um, give a very different recommendation for what actions you should undertake than others. One might advocate contact tracing versus a mass immunization campaign or whatever. So 
sometimes it's useful to look at the, the global character of the distribution of particles rather than just at the you know, expected value or the, the median value across all particles. So you know, means and medians are of some interest. There are people who use particle filtering to get at that in a more robust way. I personally think the global features of the distribution for nonlinear models are of considerable interest. And, um, and therefore, we do a lot of plotting of, of, of these sort of plots, which are 2D density plots, which capture you know, the distribution is, is, is sort of centered here, but has a high upper bound, et cetera. I will note Coleman filtering has one belief. It has a maximum likelihood estimate associated with it. It thinks the, max, the most likely state of the system is this, and it has a covariance matrix around it. It can't capture, you know, uh, multimodal distributions worth a hill of beans. It, 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 it sort of has to put its eggs in the basket of this is the most likely case, and it's not able to deal with these multiple basins of attraction that are characteristic of nonlinear models nearly as well. So the T the T minus one distributions on that plot mm. are they sort of um, clean uh, clean cleaned up over time, or as we observe more data? Oh, oh, okay. So you mean like for past states? Yeah. So this gets to my answer to the earlier question. Um, for these earlier states, good good question. So what's shown in these graphs, and what's shown in those exquisite graphs that uh, Xiao Yan has has uh, has has done for so many um, diseases is actually cross sectional. So this is actually a cross sectional depiction at any one time of the posterior distribution, following observing like this point. What was the what was the distribution across all particles, right? Associated with um, its expected number of people that would be reported, um, but and and this is cross-sectional. So you're just summarizing here the distribution of particles that obtained at the time, and as one goes forward, one fills that in with um, successive uh, values. And unfortunately, I don't don't have a nice, uh, but you know this this gives an example, right? Is, as time goes forward from this time, shown with this dotted line here, to that time, you sort of fill in these things, but it doesn't change this. You notice there's no real, there's no change back here. But that's because this is cross-sectional. Um, uh, we're, we're just summarizing sort of as it was at the posterior following that observation. We're not updating it following all these things. This idea of sampling trajectories, if you want to get an understanding of what was going on here. Your understanding of what was going on historically may be much more sad. It's like the, remember we said with the uh, hidden Markov model that let's suppose we have a situation where, you know, um, I have a, um, every one second I measure my accelerometry readings. And, you know, and maybe the reading for, for ton t is, um, is quite ambiguous. Um, or say time t minus one, to use your terminology, time t minus one is very ambiguous. But time t, I get a reading that very clearly marks the phone as being off person, or maybe it very clearly marks me as sick, okay? Um, because I don't change postures, even on once a second, um, that tells us quite a lot. It, it raises greatly the plausibility that I was sitting the last second. Okay. Um, similarly, let's suppose the next 10 observations I have, time t, time t plus 1, times t plus 2, plus time t plus 3, they just very clearly show I'm sitting. Probably at time t minus 1 I was sitting. Well, it's possible I wasn't. It's possible I was just sitting down. Um, but, um, but the chances are pretty good that at time t minus 1 that I may well have been sitting. And so at later data points, you know, tell us something about what was going on earlier um, in general, right? The fact that these are consistently low tells us something about probably how many susceptible people there were there, for example, or how many infected people there were. Certainly tells us, in terms of joint distribution, there weren't many, there weren't a lot of susceptibles and a lot of, of infectives at the same time, or else we would have seen a big, you know, outbreak. So in short, later data points do tell you about earlier things. 
But this graph doesn't show that. To show that, what you do, pursuant to my answer to the question there, is you actually sample from trajectories at the final time. You ask about that particle's belief, not only at that time, you ask about, hey, particle, um, what was your belief at this time? Who was your mom? Who was your mom? And what did she believe at the previous time? And who was your grandma? And what, what, what were their belief at time? Remember, each particle believes one thing at a given time. So you're just asking about their ancestry. You're tracing back their ancestry. You're tracing back the beliefs of their forefathers or foremothers, right, um, uh, in previous times. And you trace it back over, you know, however many times you want to. And you may find that, that the particles now, because they've been savvy for what's gone on since that point, they actually know a lot more about what must have been the case, what must have been brewing much earlier. Example um, from the world of infectious disease, consider, um, consider tuberculosis, a very long latent period. Um, Saskatchewan stopped doing sur mass surveys in the 1970s concerning rates of latent TB infection in communities. We actually don't have really good reading for communities throughout Saskatchewan and how many people are latently affected with, with TB. It took massive amounts of efforts. There were some years in the 1930s and 40s, I think, where hundreds of thousands of people were screened per year in mass screens. We don't do it anymore. And so our knowledge about how many people today are infected with latent TB is quite minimal. But I tell you, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, based on how many people have gotten active TB between now and then, we'll probably have a much better reading on how many people are latently infected right now in our population than we do now. Um, chronic disease, right? We don't know how many people um, have uh, undiagnosed pre-diabetes out there in the population, but if we look 10 years on, how many people have diabetes, it will probably tell us something about how many people there were latently out there in the population. It's the same basic idea here. You ask about the particle, and you ask about the particle's mother, and you ask about its mother, and its mother, and its mother, and the particles that have been consistent explaining the whole swack of data till now, the whole sequence, honed in the crucible of empirical evidence by all these successive observations over time. The survival of the very fittest. Those particles will have ancestors that, that, that were savvy um, and because their generations of children survived, um, uh, that ancestor was doing something right and the children were doing something right um, that even matched up later data, like data about TB incidents many decades later or, or you know, diabetes incidents 10 years later. And so those children now, they're going to have a set of ancestors that had great wisdom and had, had a good understanding of what was going on, or else this, this, this current generation wouldn't be around. That, that particle wouldn't be in this current generation. It would have been eliminated. So we can ask about trajectories and sample from trajectories, and that can give us a much better picture of what was going on decades ago or years ago. You know, how many incipient cases of mental health issues there were of, of early suicidal ideation based on what's happened later. You know, you can, you can think of all sorts of issues, but um, basically it tells you what was upstream um, back then that was coming, uh, coming due over time in light of what's happened since. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's a beautiful use of particle filtering, and it's one that's not yet been tapped in all its richness. But I have confidence that even within this room lie people who will soon tap the wisdom of, the, of the, the ancestry of the particles because we have the mechanisms to trace it and in fact they play a key role, ladies and gentlemen, in PMCMC as we'll be talking about tomorrow because um, PMCMC samples from ancestries and we maintain an ancestry matrix and it does so and brings particle filtering to the fruition, ladies and gentlemen, of its Anyway, with those words, I invite you to the to the fruits of Marcus Hall. Okay. Thank you very much.
and now I've got to see why my phone was buzzing. Christine may, may have a need for me. <laughs>